Take your Bibles and turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. Just a couple of uh, business a little bit. And so uh, next Sunday is Time Change Sunday. I say that now because we don't have that in our announcements. And we want to remind you, it's Fallback Sunday. And so you get an extra hour. So you know what that means? That means that, man, everybody ought to be here next Sunday early in their spot ready to go because you're going to have plenty of time to do that. And so um, so I just wanted to remind you, next Sunday is Time Change Sunday. Also, I wanted to announce, so today we conclude our Habakkuk series. Next Sunday, we're, we're beginning a series called Unsinkable, and I'm excited about this series because not only are we going to be preaching it here at Hollywood Community Church, but some 100 churches around Broward County are going to be preaching the exact same thing at the exact same time. How cool is that? And so uh, as churches, we've come together and we've sat back and thought, how cool would it be if all of us for a month stood in the pulpit and we preached the exact same thing? And so many of the churches, you name the bigger ones, um, from uh, uh, Church by the Glades to Calvary Chapel to Coral Ridge to the smaller churches around us, we're going to be preaching the exact same sermon series So I think that's really cool. It demonstrates unity in the body of Christ as God grows and God builds his church here in Broward County. And so the simple thing that we're going to be dealing with, we're going to be dealing with four simple and practical truths of the gospel. And so we're sitting back, and so if you have a friend, if you have a neighbor, if you have someone who does not know Jesus, this is going to be a great opportunity for you to invite them to come because we are clearly going to be articulating the gospel in the next few weeks. And so I'm excited about that, and so you please make sure and be here. So I want to begin today by playing a little game, all right? So I want you to play a game with me as we begin. The game very simply is this. I've titled the game, What Would It Take? All right? Just a simple game. So uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. What would it take? And you think through. If, if you feel free to answer, you play along with me today. So the first is this. What would it take to make you give up on your favorite sports team? Some of you might sit back and think, been there, done that, right? Already done that right there this year, all right? What would it take for you to give up on your favorite sports team? For them not to win a game at all, for them to trade your favorite player, for you to walk away and say, man, I've cheered for this team for so many years, but I am done. I actually, I text uh, some of our guys on Saturday. You guys know I'm a huge college football fan, and I text some of our guys, and one of our guys who is a UM fan, last week at the end of the week, I sent him a, a text quickly and say, boy, sorry about the game, and he wrote me back and said, I'm done. I'm, I'm done, Brian. Of course, when UM won yesterday, he was no longer done. He was all excited about UM. So here's the second question. What would it take for you to quit your job? For you just to walk away, you sit back and say, Brian, if I won the lottery, I would quit my job right away, huh? Or maybe it would be if your boss just treated you in a way that you do not deserve to be treated, and you say, you know what, I'm done, I'm out of here. What would it take? Some, sometimes we live these scenarios. What would it take? What would it take for you to sell your house and move to another state. Maybe we had asked Cleeton that. Maybe, maybe it would take your grandkids being somewhere else. We find that, especially here in Hollywood. Hollywood is one of the most transitional places, transitory places in South Florida. What would it take for you to say, I am out of here. I'm selling my house. I'm moving somewhere else. Here's the fourth question. What would it take for you to have a crisis of faith and walk away from God. What would it take, what would have to happen in your life for you to sit back and say, man, I'm done. <laughs> I, I've done this, I've practiced this, I've been faithful, I've done all of this, but I just can't take it anymore. I am done. Well, as you've seen the last three weeks, that is precisely the dilemma that Habakkuk faced. 
For the past three weeks, we've been uh, tracing Habakkuk's personal journey from a place of questioning, doubt, and confusion to a place of faith, hope, and confidence. I was reading this week, and, and Vance Havner makes a, a great, or made a great statement. He's with the Lord now, but he made a great statement about the book of Habakkuk. He says that the book of Habakkuk begins with a question mark, but it ends with an exclamation point. I love that. And by the way, there's, a, there's nothing wrong with having moments of question marks in our life. There's nothing wrong with having times in which we sit back and we question, we don't understand, and maybe even to be a little confused, as long as it drives us to God instead of driving us away from God. We began this series by admitting that there are many things that happen in life that just don't make sense to us. We could list so many of them. Why, why do some people experience great wealth while others experience extreme poverty? It just doesn't make sense. How can God, as Jose mentioned last week in the message, how can God allow little children to be bought and sold as sex slaves? We, we look at the new, and it just doesn't make any sense to us. Maybe you're here today and you were abused as a child and you sit back and say, Brian, I don't understand, why did my parent not love me? And why did my parent abuse me as a child? Or maybe you're here today and you're struggling financially and you're sitting back asking the question, why doesn't God help me pay my bills? I've cried out to him, I have, I have financial needs and I've asked God to meet those needs and as of yet, he's chosen not to do so. Maybe today you're in a state of confusion. How do we respond when life just doesn't make sense? Brad answered that question in the first message of the series. The answer simply was this, look up. When, when life doesn't make sense around you, look up. Take your eyes off of your circumstances and put your eyes on God. As Habakkuk asked that question, God responded to him with the statement, For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told it to you. We then, in the second week of our series, asked the question, Why doesn't God answer my prayers? All of us have struggled with that at times. We've prayed and we've asked God to do something, and yet, for some reason, God has not answered our prayers. And the answer we saw very simply is this. Live like you believe it, even if you don't see it. In other words, it's this. We walk by faith, and we don't walk by sight. The problem with us at times is we want all of the answers to us. We always want one plus one to equal two, and two plus two to equal four. And we want God to give us all of those answers, and he doesn't always give us those answers. Last week, Pastor Jose did a wonderful job challenging us in the area of personal revival. And he challenged us with this thought, revival comes when we are in awe of God. In other words, when we see God as he really is. David, just a few moments ago, read Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, and we didn't take the time and flesh out those verses, but in those verses, Habakkuk gives us a visual depiction of who God is. And as Brad mentioned, Habakkuk goes back and he reminds himself of everything that God had done for the children of Israel and how God had brought them up to this point. By the way, Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 3 through 15 is a prayer that Habakkuk wrote. Some have said that it is a hymn that Habakkuk sung with a beautiful description of who God is. I'd encourage you to go home and spend some time reading it today. The simple truth is this. The book of Habakkuk is all about faith in God. As a matter of fact, the theme verse we saw it several weeks ago, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, that says this, The just shall live by faith. 
And I trust that today that you are living by faith for this reason, because the writer of Hebrews says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you and I are not demonstrating faith on a regular basis, God is not pleased with our lives. I would sit back and and answer one question because you might say, Brian, why are we spending time in the book of Habakkuk, which is kind of an obscure book in the Old Testament? And the simple truth is this, prophetic books are, are important. We spend a lot of time in the Gospels. We spend a lot of time in Paul's writings, but prophetic books are important. Think about this, prophetic books deal with the weighty issues of life. Someone has said this, that without the Old Testament prophets, our faith would grow shallow and weak, unable to stand up to the rigors of life. We live in a day in which the best-selling books, and quite frankly, the most popular preachers, tell you how to prosper, tell you how to succeed, tell you how to live the good life. And let's be honest, it's not hard to have faith when you are prospering, succeeding, and living your best life right now. It's not hard to have faith in those moments. But the book of Habakkuk and the Old Testament prophets teach us to have faith not in the best of times, but how you and I can have faith in the worst of times. It teaches us how to have faith, not when we're living on the mountaintop, but how do we have faith when we are living in the valley? And you might sit back today and say, Brian, that's not me. Everything's good, man. Money in the bank, kids are healthy. I'm healthy, man. I'm living it. Listen, you know as well as I do, there is going to come a time in your life when you're going to walk through the valley. And it's really easy to have faith when everything is going well. But Habakkuk teaches us how do we have faith when the roof caves in? How do we have faith when everything seems to be going wrong? That's what Habakkuk talks about in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. And so if you have your Bibles, your iPhones, your iPad, join with me. So so David read chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. I'm going to pick up where David stopped reading in verse 16 of Habakkuk chapter 3. So follow along. Habakkuk chapter 3, we'll put the verses up on the screen. Here's what Habakkuk says. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound rottenness enters into my bones my legs tremble beneath me yet i will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who evade us verse 17 though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the star stalls yet i will rejoice in the lord I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like deer's, like deer's feet. He makes me tread on my high places. To the choir master with stringed instruments. Just a little instruction Habakkuk gives for those who are going to sing those verses. Would you pray with me today? God, increase our faith today. Uh, Father, I don't know where everybody in the congregation is today. Lord, I, I'm sure there's some that are here today whose faith is just incredibly strong. They've seen you act in their lives and, and their faith is strong. Lord, there maybe are some others here today that are struggling. Things just don't seem to be going the way they want them to go. And They question where you are and what you're doing. It's hard for them to see your hand in their lives. Maybe they've cried out to you, and for one reason or another, they don't feel like they have received a response. God, I pray that you would strengthen our faith today. Help us to see that God is alive and well in our lives. And help us to learn to trust you no matter what. Teach us from your word today, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So three things if you have your outline today. The first one very simply is this. When you are afraid, rest in the Lord. Let me say that again. When you are afraid, rest in the Lord. Say that with me today, rest in the Lord. Say that with me, 
rest in the Lord. I want to talk about what that means. To rest in the Lord doesn't mean that I'm going to put my hands behind my back, get in my lazy boy chair, and just sit there and do absolutely nothing. You know, Vicky could have asked me yesterday when I'm watching football game after football game, Brian, what are you doing? I'm resting in the Lord. That's what I'm doing. That's not what Habakkuk talks about here. The challenge is that when we are fearful, our responsibility is to rest. Let me remind you why Habakkuk was afraid. Maybe you haven't been here through the series, but God had revealed to Habakkuk that his country was about to be invaded. That the nation of Israel would not only be invaded by a foreign army, but that they would be ransacked. Habakkuk and his neighbors would lose everything they had accumulated through the years. They would lose their jobs, they would lose their homes, they would lose their savings, they would lose their lifestyle. In just a matter of a few days, everything that they had, everything that they possessed would be gone. How would you respond today if all of a sudden a foreign country invaded the United States? And from one week to another, one day to another, the lifestyle, the comfortable lifestyle that we had, all of a sudden we lost our homes, our jobs, our way of life. We lost absolutely everything. I know we sit back and say, why, that would never happen in the United States. Well, it might not happen in the United States, but it happens all around the world. How do believers hold on to their faith in those moments, and how do we respond? Notice as a result of that prophecy, Habakkuk was terrified. And by the way, God didn't tell Habakkuk this might happen. God told Habakkuk this is going to happen. Prepare yourself. As a result, Habakkuk was terrified. Notice how his terror is described in verse 16. He says, my body trembles, my lips quiver, my legs tremble beneath me. Can I ask you today, how do you respond to extreme fear? What do you do when you're so scared that your heart is pounding in your chest and you can feel it pounding in your chest? What do you do when, you're, when your hands shake? What do you do when it feels like your legs are going to buckle beneath you? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've been there. And if you haven't been there, you will be there one day. As the doctor looks across from you and says, I'm sorry, I got bad news. Or the phone rings in the middle of the night and you realize, oh no, that's the phone call that I do not want. How do you respond when all of a sudden you were overcome by great fear? Notice how Habakkuk responds. He describes how his body responds, but notice at the end of verse 16, he makes this statement. He says, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble. If you have an NIV in front of you, an NIV and other translations say this, I will patiently wait. It's interesting that the phrase quietly wait comes from the Hebrew word meaning to rest. That's why we get our point there, that when you're afraid, rest in the Lord. That phrase, quietly wait, it's translated here, quietly or patiently wait, but in other places in the Old Testament, it's translated rest. This, by the way, is the exact same word that is used when God gave the Ten Commandments, and he talked about the Sabbath, and he said on the Sabbath, you're supposed to do what? Rest. Same Hebrew word here. It's the same word that is used when God promised the nation of Israel, one day I'm going to send you to the promised land. And right now, life is difficult. But when you get to the promised land, Exodus chapter 33 and verse 14, there you will find rest. Same word that's found here in Habakkuk, in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 16. Habakkuk says this, when I am fearful, here's what I do. I quietly wait. I rest in the Lord. Now, now you and I can say amen to that, and we mark that down as a great biblical truth, and we can sit back and say, okay, that's what I want to do whenever fear comes. But it's one thing to know it up here, and it's another thing to put it in practice. Is it not? 
Whenever, whenever that bad news comes, whenever that fear comes, it's one thing to know it, it's another thing to do it. Let me give you five steps to help you rest they're not uh, in your outline, but let me give them to you. Five steps that will help you rest in the moment of fear. The first is this. Release your burdens. Release your burdens. First Peter 5, 7, we looked at this verse a few weeks ago as we looked at baggage. But, but Peter says this. Casting all of your cares, casting all of your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. So I mentioned a few moments ago, we tend to think that resting is doing nothing. But rest in the Bible is not a passive verb. Rest in the Bible is an action verb. And rest is this action verb, this transaction, as it will, that goes on between you and God. And resting doesn't mean, as I insinuated a few moments ago, that I'm sitting in the lazy boy saying, okay, God, bring me this, that, and the other. I'd like to have a glass of iced tea, and then it'd be great if you'd provide me this. I'm resting. That's not what the term means. Resting is this divine trust. To trust, to rest is a verb. It means that God, with your help, I'm going to give up worrying. I'm going to give up reasoning. I'm going to give up anxiety. And I want to enter into your rest with simple, childlike faith. Here's what it means practically. And this is, this is for me too. It means you stop Googling your symptoms and you start reading God's word. Does that make sense? Does that resonate with anybody else? You sit back and, and uh, Vicki's smiling because she knows I do this all the time. So all of a sudden, Brad and I, where's Brad? Brad and I are notorious about this. And so all of a sudden we have a pain and that pain in my mind is turned from a pain to I'm dying of cancer. I only have just a I only have a few weeks to live. Uh, I googled this and somebody who had this exact pain didn't live longer than just a couple of months, that's what's going to happen to me. How do you rest when you do that? That's not resting in the Lord. Resting is okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust God. I'm going to roll that worry, I'm going to roll that anxiety over on to Him. I'm going to release that burden. And by the way, that can only be done through faith. Here's the second thing that I would encourage you to do when you're afraid. Release the burden. Surrender your will. Surrender your will. Resting in the Lord is also giving up the ego to not have your way. Surrendering to God's will helps you rest. You will know that you have reached this place when you trust Him to work everything out without your Resting means, okay, God, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm going to surrender it to you because your will is better than mine. And so I surrender myself to you. By the way, even in situations like this, and sometimes we deal with this, we're in a situation where, where we're accused of something falsely or somebody makes slanderous statements against us or, or gossips against us, and we feel like we have to what? We have to defend ourselves. We have to stand up and we have to prove that's not the case rather than sitting back and saying, God, you know everything. And God, I'm going to surrender the situation to you. And I'm going to rest in you for you to resolve it your way. So the first is this. Release your burden. Surrender your will. Here's the third one. This is really cool. Know you are loved. Know you are loved. It's easy to know you're loved whenever God's blessings are just gushing at you, right? I mean, I mean, there's times in our life where we're receiving God's blessings and it's just like we're drinking from a fire hose, right? God's just given us this, that, we're getting so many things. And it's easy for us to say back, say, oh my word, God loves me. Look what he's doing in my life. But I would submit to you this morning that you are just as loved when everything bad is happening in your life as when everything that's happening in your life is good. Let me show you a verse. I love these two verses. Romans chapter 8 Verses 35 and then verse 37. Notice what Paul says. Paul asked the question, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Question mark. Shall tribulation? Rhetorical question. What's the answer? No. Distress? 
No. Persecution. No. Famine. No. Nakedness. No. Danger or sword. Paul is saying none of those things separate you and I for the love of God, from the love of God. Even when we're going through those things, we are immensely loved by God. Verse 37. No, in all of these things, which things? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors. How? Through him who what? Who loved us. See, when you go through that difficult time, sit back and remind yourself that even in that valley, God loves you. You are special to him. You are the apple of his eye. He cares for you. He will not abandon you. He loves you. And the fourth thing I'd mention is this, find hope. Find hope. Release your burden. Surrender your will. Know that you are loved and find hope hope that's exactly what Habakkuk did God had told Habakkuk that invasion destruction and loss were coming but he also assured him that one day God would judge the Babylonians for their sins and that he would ultimately deliver his people so in the midst of fears here's what Habakkuk did he waited patiently for God The ability to step away from the busy world is a blessing. Or enter into divine rest, excuse me, is a blessing that can be yours and mine. As I mentioned a few moments ago, stepping back and trying to figure everything out, making sure that all of this adds up or all of this adds up, never works. And it will only lead to frustration, and not only frustration, but it will lead to a lack of faith in our lives. Give it to God. Rest in Him. Allow rest to be an active part of your life. Does that make sense today, church? I hope so. When you're afraid, rest in the Lord. That's what Habakkuk did. Notice the second thing that Habakkuk says. When everything is going wrong, rejoice in the Lord. When everything is going wrong, rejoice in the Lord. And once again, it's easy to rejoice when everything is going right, right? We can write songs. God, I'm healthy. All of my kids are healthy. All of my grandkids are healthy. I have money in the bank. We're going on vacation. Everything is good. Praise you. We can do that on a regular basis. It's easy to praise when everything is going well. But it's hard to praise. Not when just one or two things are going wrong, but when everything is going wrong. I want you to see the scenario that Habakkuk paints in the passage. He actually p- paints three different scenarios. So notice, notice in verse 17, he says this, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. So so let me give you three scenarios. Once again, this isn't in your outline, but write this down. Here's what he says. He says, first scenario, the future looks bleak. The future looks bleak. Some of this agricultural analogy we don't understand, but the blossoms on the fig tree and the grapes forming on the vines refer to the fact that you are trusting in the future. Those flowers, those blossoms indicate what? That fruit is coming. That there is something after those blossoms. That those plants are going to produce fruits. So Habakkuk says, what happens when there's no flower? on the vine when they don't blossom when the grapes are not going to be produced he says what your future looks bleak what he mentions there are symbols of hope to come it's not just a blossom it's not just a flower it's a tangible sign that the future looks good and Habakkuk sits back and says there's times that the future doesn't look good 
the future looks bleak. And so the first one is this, your future looks bleak. The second one is this, the present situation is barren. Because he says this, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no fruit, no food. Here's what he means. You planted your crops, you've cultivated them, and you were expecting a harvest. And now it's finally time for the harvest to come. And what happened? The crops fail. If I was speaking to a congregation of farmers today, you would understand what I'm talking about to put all that work, all that time, all that effort into planting a crop, cultivating the crop, taking care of the crop, waiting for that crop to produce a harvest, and then something happens that the harvest does not come. And it happens to farmers in our country sometimes. You're looking at your income from that year for that year, your present situation absolutely failing. The fields produce no food. All the work and all the effort come to nothing. Let's put that in our modern day vernacular. After years of faithful service to a company, you lose your job and the company lets you go. And you sit back and think, I've put all this time and effort into my career and now on the latter stages of my career, they have let me go. You've invested in the stock market, looking forward to that day when you can retire. And close to your retirement, the stock market goes belly up, and your investment is not half what it used to be. You work hard to see a relationship succeed. You've really invested in this relationship, and you want this relationship to succeed only to see it fail. That's what Habakkuk is talking about, your present situation is barren. He mentions a third scenario. You sit back and say, Brian, stop. I'm discouraged already. He mentions a third scenario. Look, at the end of the verse, he says, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no, no herd in the stalls. I've characterized it this way. You're broke. <laughs> You're broke. In, in, in Old Testament times, a herd, sheep and cattle, were, were symbols of reserves. You see, see, it is milk and meat for a rainy day. Okay, there, the, there might not be crops in the field, but we got cows in the stalls, all right? We, we got cows that we can draw milk from, and we have sheep out in the fields. We have reserves for a rainy day. But in this scenario, you have no reserves to fall back on. To put it in modern day terms, there's no money in the bank, there are no reserves, and you are broke. Once again, it's easy to rejoice when the future is bright, when the present is blessed, and when the reserves are plentiful. But notice Habakkuk, he's different. He is determined to rejoice in God in spite of the circumstances not because of the circumstances. Catch that, church. How, how can you rejoice? Do you only rejoice whenever good things are happening in your life? But can you rejoice whenever you get the bad news? Can you rejoice not only at times of plenty, but you can rejoice in times of poverty as well? You can rejoice not only in times of health, but you can rejoice in times of sickness. This morning in our prayer time, Wilson was talking about a friend of a friend that he works with who was just given two months to live. And instead of sitting there mourning the condition that she's in, she's joyful. She's inviting others to come and visit with her. And she's sharing the joy of the Lord. Not in times of blessing, but in times of sickness. That's exactly what Habakkuk says, he said, though all these three scenarios might take place, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. As I read this, I was reminded of the Apostle Paul, some of the words of the Apostle Paul. Whether you're familiar or not, but, but, but several of the New Testament books are what we call prison epistles. 
The prison epistles are, are books, they're letters that Paul wrote when he was in prison, when he was shackled. All right, he wasn't at the Hilton, you know, enjoying a buffet breakfast. He was in prison, shackled, and while he was in prison, he wrote several of the New Testament books. One of those books is the book of Philippians. And you would think that Paul, who was in prison, would be going through this time of, of a personal anguish and struggle in worshiping the Lord. But Paul makes this statement in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. He says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Once again, he wrote that in prison. And if you read the New Testament, how many times do we find Paul and Barnabas and other prisoners in prison singing, having a worship service in prison? They learned to do what? To praise in the midst of difficulty. I love this verse in 1 Thessalonians, also one of the prison epistles. Do we have this next verse? Paul says this, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Notice what he says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He doesn't say that God's will is for you to escape it and for that, that, that momentary poverty to become a huge blessing. He says, no, whatever your circumstances, rejoice, for this is God's will for you. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, I didn't put it up on the screen, but that prison epistle, Paul makes this statement, which blows my mind. He says this, I have learned whatever my situation is to be content, to be happy. In other words, so Paul says, I can be happy in prison or I can be happy in a plush circumstance. I can be happy in health or I can be happy not having health. I can be happy with much or I can be happy with little. Here's what Habakkuk says. When everything is going wrong, rejoice in the Lord. Let me show you a third thing, and we'll be done today. The third thing that he says this, when you feel weak, rely on the Lord. When you feel weak, rely on the Lord. The first is this, when you're afraid, rest in the Lord. When everything is going wrong, rejoice in the Lord. The third thing is this, when you feel weak, rely on the Lord. Notice verse 19, what he says. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like deer's, like deer's feet. He makes me tread on my high places. Now, most of us are city folks, right? Anybody here is country? Anybody here country? Vicky's got her hand up, a few others, so they might. But most of us are city folks, so we read some of these country um, illustrations, and they go right over our head. By the way, I want you to know, so yesterday I was at a restaurant right here, just about a stone's flow from here. I go out to my car, and on the wall right in front of my car was a raccoon right there. All right, I have a picture of it, you can see it. So even though we're in the city, sometimes we get a glimpse of the country, right? So, so we, we read what Habakkuk's saying, and if we're not careful, it goes right over our feet. So notice the picture that Habakkuk is painting. He speaks of a deer's ability to walk and run on rocky paths of a mountaintop. He's talking about a deer who's steady. A deer who is sure-footed. A deer who is unafraid. And he's saying that with God on our side, we can even traverse the rocky places of life and our feet, our walk, still be steady and secure, just like a deer's feet. And here's what he says. He's not saying, must up the courage and you be strong. Habakkuk's not even saying that he is strong. Notice what he says. God is my strength. God the Lord is my strength. Can you say that today? God's not asking you today to be tough. He's not asking you today to be cur courageous. He's not asking you today to, to suck it up and just go through it and to be strong. He's asking you today to depend upon him and allow him to be your strength. Once again, as I read this, 
I thought of the Apostle Paul. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul kind of pulls back the curtain and allows us to see just a little glimpse of himself. And Paul makes a statement there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said this, he said, I had a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan that buffeted me, that attacked me. Now there's been a lot of speculation as to what Paul was referring to. Some have guessed that Paul had this physical ailment and they've guessed everything from elephantitis to, uh, to having deformed hands because somebody else wrote for him. We don't know exactly what it is. Some things that think that Paul was simply oppressed by a demon because there in the passage he says there was a messenger of Satan that attacked me. And others think maybe it was just the persecution that he was going under from the church, the, the, the Judaism that was there when he was preaching. We're not sure, but Paul says this, I had this thorn in the flesh that buffeted me. I had something that affected me. And here's what Paul said, I asked God three times to remove it. Can you relate with that? God, God I got this physical ailment. Please heal me of it. God, I got this thorn in the flesh, this, this messenger of Satan, my neighbor who's driving me crazy. Please free me from him or her. Or God, I'm being treated unjustly. God, please free me from this. And I ask God not once, not twice, not three times. And God's response is not to heal me. God's response is not to free me from that. God's response is this, and you can see it in the passage. He tells Paul, he said, here's my answer. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. In other words, God's answer to Paul was not relief. It was not freedom from the problem that was bothering him. God's answer to Paul was this, trust in me. Allow me to be your strength. Even when life doesn't make sense. Even when you want free. And Paul makes this testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. Notice it, memorize it, allow it to sink into your mind and heart. He says this, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness. I'm content with insults, with hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Wow, can you say that today? <laughs> I don't know whether I could ever say that. Okay, God, you know what? I'm good with it. I lost my job. That's okay. <laughs> God, I'm not going to live long. That's all right. I'm not sure what we're going to eat tomorrow. I'm good with that, God. I'm, uh, I'm content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Can you put that verse back up? Because I want you to see that last phrase. Paul makes this statement. For when I am weak... Then I am strong. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Listen, church, here's what I want you to get. The God who is in you is greater and stronger than the circumstances around you. Let that sink into your mind and heart. The God who is in you is greater and stronger than any circumstances you might face. And so with Paul, with Habakkuk, whenever those situations come, can you sit back and say this, I am trusting in God no matter 